Okay, let's kick off. So just as a, a reminder for those who maybe who've not been on one of the calls before, um, everybody will be joining on mute. If you have any questions, please use the chat window. Um, Jan can then deal with those questions at the end. If there's anything urgent, um, then I can, uh, I can step in and we can uh, raise it at that point. But otherwise, we'll look to do questions at the end of the session. Um, can I also ask you to take time at the end to fill out the feedback form, because this is always very useful for the speakers, particularly when you're speaking in an environment here where you get absolutely no feedback over the course of the session. So knowing how it's gone is uh, very useful. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to uh, introduce my colleague, Jen, from the Hursley Lab. And as you'll hear when she opens her mouth, she's not a local, but we've got her here and we're going to keep her now we've got her. Um, so uh, just a reminder, this is session 2 a.m. on the skills and learning session. So if you're the wrong one, this is the time to go. Otherwise, Jen, it's all yours. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Jim Francis. So as you can tell from the accent, I am a transplant here to Hursley. Um, but it's been a lot of fun being here and I am glad they're going to keep me. Um, so as I load up my PowerPoint and ready to share, um, let's get started. Um, yeah, please pop your questions into the chat as they occur and I will look at them um, when we get to the end. For your reference, the QR code you'll find at the beginning on the title slide as well as on the agenda and it's also at the end. So if you have the app on your phone, you should be able to scan that and fill out the survey. Um, let me know what you'd like to know more of, um, you know, all sorts of things like that. Uh, all right, so hope you have your coffee, your tea or your beverage of choice and uh, let's get going. All right, so we're going to take a look at the history of containers. So we are going to do some time traveling this morning. I don't have my DeLorean, but you know, we're just going to travel back in time anyway. So we're going to take a trip back to the not so dark ages to the year 2000. Not that long ago, feels like yesterday. And I've got the picture of Super Mario Brothers, which I realize predates 2000, but I thought it was still kind of fitting because people younger than me, the younger generations will feel like those were probably at the same time. All right, so in the year 2000, if you were looking to install programs, what would you do? How would you do that? Well, in 1998, apps became available. So depending on your distro, you might have um, used app to install your packages and programs. Um, around 1999, Yum came out in 2002. We saw Pac-Man come out. So these things are great. If you want to install something like, um, let's say, you know, Go or Python or something like that, you can use these programs um, or package managers to install uh, those different packages. And it did make things a lot easier. You weren't pulling down source and trying to extract it and, and different things like that. It just made it easier to manage and update. Big improvement, right? These are all great. But if you've ever tried to install a package, they usually also have prereqs or other things that are needed because every distribution of Linux generally, however you set it up, they're all gonna vary. So there's gonna be other libraries and things that are needed. And sometimes the package managers are able to tell you and handle it and other times they're not. So let's take a look. So this is me actually installing Node Red using a package manager. So in this case, I'm using Zipper, I'm on a SLES image. Um, and I'm just installing Node Red. So I've given you the link. If you went to the Node Red website, so they're getting started on your local system, you would find out that the only prereq you need is Node.js. Sounds really simple, right? If you watch the graphic on the right, you can actually see it's not quite that simple. I was able to search and install Node 10, which I had checked and that was one of the ones that was supported um, that installed easily, no problem. But then as I start trying to install Node Red, I get some errors. So I got like a make error, couldn't find the make file, um, which eventually I figured out meant, okay, well make itself isn't installed. Who knew that you had to install that? So I had to figure out how to install that, but that also indicated that um, GCC and GCC C++ 
um, those compilers were not installed. So I also needed those. So you'll see me in a second um, doing that. So I'm just installing zipper or using zipper to install make and now GCC. Um, but all this troubleshooting ended up taking me hours. Um, I had permission errors. So I was looking at that, trying to figure out what's going on. I ended up switching out of trying to do a global install because of how this particular system is set up. Um, but it, it took hours of time. And if you're somebody that you're having to set up a lot of different systems to deploy your applications across, that can make a rollout of an update or a new application incredibly slow. And I was only installing one thing. So let's look at a real scenario. So full credit to the people who put this blog out, um, but they documented what happened when they were trying to work with um, an application setup. So they're running a Node.js app that talked to a database. I think it was like a Postgres SQL database. Um, they also had a Golang app and then they used a Python app that talked in there, but they needed to have um, made highly available their Node app or their JavaScript app really talking to the database. And then they had another web front end. So it seems like a fairly simple architecture. You've got this kind of Python and Golang app that are talking to the database, maybe doing some you know, independent work, um, but they don't have to be duplicated or, or made highly available. It's really just that, that node app. Um, easy enough. We make sure nodes installed, we install the database, um, Python, Golang, no big deal, right? But once you get those things set up and you start them running, that's a lot of different things to monitor. So you are gonna probably have a running log or a way to pipe your output to see what's happening with your database, uh, with your Node app, uh, with your Go app, uh, with your Python app. It's just a lot of things to check, a lot of things that can happen. And we have to start putting those on different servers. It just becomes cumbersome very quickly. So this is where the need for containers really came in. So there has to be a better way to do this. So what's something that could help with agility and DevOps? So ideally you want something kind of self-surface. You really want something that's easier to deploy that can run anywhere. And ideally we would want something that run, you can run on the same host with isolation. So now we're gonna start time traveling back to present day. So in 2001, there was a project called vServer that came out. And this allowed for general purpose Linux servers to run on a single box with a high degree of independence and security. And so this is really kind of the first evolution of containers. So they weren't completely um, independent of each other, but it actually did allow for you to have multiple Linux servers on a single box. A few years later in 2004, Solaris containers came out. So this actually had a full application environment and they use something called Solaris zones. So basically building on top of that vServer project, but now we're having this full application environment. And really the big changes started coming in 2006. So 2006 brought what became C groups. So I didn't even know this so I was researching it, but this is when Google actually launched their process containers. And this was to isolate and limit the resource usage of a process. So those Linux servers that could run earlier with some independence or high degree of independence, they actually now are gonna have the ability thanks to C groups to limit the resource usage um, and, and start to isolate them. So this means that each group gets a share of the memory, CPU and disk IO so they don't create a monopoly. Um, it wasn't originally called C groups that name didn't come till 2007 but that's what most of us that work with containers will know it as so that's why I gave it that name. Um, but those are still in use today. So that's really where we started to see the whole idea of containers coming into play. It wasn't until 2008 um, when a couple other things happened that we actually started calling things containers. So in 2008, we had kernel namespaces come out. So still in use today. So this is where you have a process and it's gonna have its own set of users. So it does allow a process to have root privileges inside of what we now call a container, but not outside of it. Um, so let's say if I am running in a C group, if I'm running in my isolated environment inside my broader Linux environment, because this all happens on Linux, um, 
I can now have root privileges in that, but I won't have root privileges on the host system. In 2008, we also had the idea of Linux containers. So this is where C groups merged into the Linux kernel, um, actually becoming part of the operating system. And this led to the creation of what became known as LXE or the Linux containers. So this is the virtualization at the operating system level that allows the multiple isolated Linux environments to run um, with a shared kernel, but each having their own process and network space. And this is really what most of us see today. 2013 is the Let Me Contain That For You project that Google started where they open sourced their container stack. Um, this is where people really started to contribute and really where containers took off from. Um, 2013 is also when Docker really started to make a big splash. So they originally released their containers as an open source project in 2013. Um, and they had the ability to package the containers to be moved from one environment to another. So unlike the let me contain that for you, that was generally going to be Linux. Um, Docker was starting to look at moving across other environments. Um, it's also important to note that Docker originally actually used the LXC that came out in 2008, but in 2014, they replaced that with libcontainer. The libcontainer was built from core concepts from that let me contain that for you project that Google started. Um, and Google then decided to contribute that to the Docker project. So it's amazing how open source collaboration has really driven the container development. And now what we know today, most of us will be mostly familiar with Docker containers. Um, it's what you hear the most about, it's what you see the most. Uh, but in actuality, there's a lot of different ways that you can use containers, um, even without Docker. So let's take a look at what these advances through the early 2000s allow us to do. So thanks to those advances, um, the kernel namespaces, the C groups, things like that, we now have portability. Um, so we have the independence to run multiple images um, with true isolation. Um, but now thanks to the different projects, let me contain it for you in the Docker projects, we actually have the portability. So everybody likes to show the, the shipping containers. I've done the same here because if you've ever had to ship something on a, on a, sh on a ship, <laughs> um, you get this container and depending on how much you're shipping, you may take the full container or maybe you're just part of the container, but it doesn't matter. All ends up on the, on the freight carrier is this, container and it's a specific size, it's standard, they stack, you can fit a lot of them on there, but there's isolation. I could have my personal stuff next to, I don't know, a crate of furniture or something from some company. It, it doesn't matter because we're all isolated. Um, you can put lots of containers on a ship and you can fill them with basically whatever you want. And this is why that kind of term container has become so popular. So let's take a look at Docker. So this is what the Docker container conceptually looks like. So every container is going to have some type of base operating system. It's then going to have its runtime and libraries. And on top of that, you'll have your application. So you've got this like little self-contained world inside this process. Um, and within that, I can then give you different permissions. And I can create different users and things like that because there is a base operating system. Um, so I can make sure all the prereqs are installed. You know, I had the little, um, it's actually a GIF that was showing all the things I had to do to get Node-RED installed on the Linux system. Um, you know, having to install make in a C compiler or C++ compiler and things like that. You can have those all set up within a container. It makes it really easy to, to then just deploy the application that you really want to use. Um, and everything is self-contained within it. So where can they run? Really, they can run virtually anywhere. So this is looking at the Docker image. Um, I like this one because it does run across a variety of platforms. So you, you could run it on Windows, you can run it on um, x86, you can run it on IBM Z on our S390X uh, architecture. You can also run it on PowerPC. So they're really made to run anywhere. So you could pull a Docker image. This is a base Docker image and you could build within it. All right, so if I'm using Docker, what does this look like? If you've never built um, a container or really worked with them, this is kind of mind blowing to me. So 
When you are working with containers, you'll usually get this thing called a Docker file. And the Docker file is really just a text file that has some instructions um, on what actions to use to create this new Docker image. Um, so you'll then use this command, docker build, that looks at that Docker file to then create what we call a Docker image. Okay, so this Docker image now that you have, so you've read this Docker file, you've told Docker, okay, build this text file basically, create an image. So your image at this point is a template that has instructions on how to create the container. So if your Docker file calls an existing Docker image, so maybe it calls the existing Docker, Docker image, or maybe it calls an existing node Docker image, um, only the top layer is built on that. So you've got your base Docker image and maybe you're just adding in some libraries in your application on top of that. Um, so it's gonna know that from your Docker file because your Docker file will have those instructions. So now you've got the idea of this image and you, you give it a name. So now we've got this template. So from this template, we can use the Docker run command. And that Docker run command will actually take that template and turn it into a running process, which we like to call the container. Um, so a few simple steps, but it makes it easy to have identical environments um, with the isolation across basically any platform that you want. Um, so sounds good, right? This is what we were after. We don't want to have to install all the different libraries and dependencies every time we want to, you know, move between a system. Um, if you're working with Docker, they have things like Docker PS, so looking at the running processes, similar to if you want to see just running processes on a Linux environment. Docker run, I mentioned Docker build, I mentioned um, you can do start and stop. So you can start and stop a container. You can also use uh, Docker RM to remove an image or a container. So how you can kind of work with your environment to keep it clean. Um, it's a little bit of a world inside an operating system world. All right, so we're gonna try installing Docker or Node right again, but as a container. So the only prereq is Docker. So if you're watching the little Giphy at the bottom of the screen, I've now just installed Docker. So I know from my experiences with Docker, I need to make sure that my user ID is part of the Docker um, group. So I make sure and I add that because when I try to run my Docker run command, so remember Docker run is gonna look at a uh, Docker image file. So node run has already built that. Um, and it's gonna just start at the container. It's that easy. I just put, made sure Docker was on there so I could basically use their CLI and I can say Docker run and it'll go pull that image in. So I gave the link with the directions and I have a little screenshot of installing it. You can see the command I was running. Um, I mapped the port so I know what port to access my node red. Uh, application or really the interface for it uh, on. And it took me less than five minutes, whereas trying to install it locally took me several hours to troubleshoot. Um, so it is really that simple. And this is why this has become such a pervasive technology and why so many people are looking at using it. It just makes life easier to have the standard way to deploy workloads, um, particularly if they're going to be um, group together or they have a lot of libraries depend that they're dependent on, which pretty much everything will. Um, so it just makes life easier. So if we go back to a bigger scenario where they had the node app and a Python app in their database and they had a Go application, um, they actually used another tool called Docker Compose. So Docker Compose just allows you to configure your environment and start up exactly as you'd like. Um, so you use these uh, files called, I call them YAML files, um, but it's like yet another markup language is what that stands for. So it looks a bit like JSON, um, but basically you're gonna be able to define in that file where you want things running, how many instances of it. So whereas the Docker file tells you what a container looks like, the Docker compose file will tell you what your complete environment looks like. So you're able to put in this um, YAML file that you want, you know, two node containers running. Um, they had to use, they had to map what volumes they wanted to use. You can do that in a Docker compose file. 
um, their go container, what volume or basically what storage they wanted to use, how they wanted the networks to be mapped, so maybe what ports they wanted things to use. Um, but basically they're able to deploy their, available, their highly available environment with all the different containers in a simple file. And then they can say Docker can compose up and it all comes up. And it really does become that easy. They're not having to go to um, two different systems and install Node um, and their database. And then on one of the systems have Go and Python and make sure everything's running and connecting and that nothing goes down. Um, they can just say, okay, Docker Compose Go and tell it where to install everything and, and it, it can do that. So now their job of a few days to set up probably goes down to, I don't know, an hour couple hours, not much. So we keep evolving. So in 2015, there was a project started called the Open Container Initiative. So this is run under the Linux Foundation and Docker and Coros were actually some of the founding members. Um, so Docker has donated its container format and runtime called RunC to the Open Container Initiative. And this becomes hugely important because for the last kind of, not quite 10 years, let's say five to eight years, mostly everybody's done Docker. And if you're familiar with Docker at all, and actually if you caught it in the prior screen, I ended up running my node red Docker container um, with root privileges, which is scary because we talked about how inside that container, you can actually have root privileges. But if you knew how to get out of that container to the host system, that process has root privileges because I didn't want to exit out of my system to pick up my Docker group that I had added. Um, and I was just doing it real quick to record it. I know it's not going to be used. Um, but running that container as root, I'm now given that process root privileges. So you could basically figure out how to use that process with root privileges to access things and change things on the host system. Um, which is kind of one of the concerns that how Docker runs has had. So Open Container Initiative actually creates the open standards um, for container formats and runtime. So Docker's donated um, their format and runtime. So it's got two specifications, the OCI does. So they've got a runtime spec and they've got an image spec. So that runtime spec is gonna be kind of similar to your Docker file. So how you, um, are going to run a file system bundle unpacked on a disk. So what are those commands? What are the files that you're going to use to do that? And then the image spec is going to be what you would take that Docker image from where you even say Docker run and how to launch that on that um, target platform. So this actually allows other people to come in. And because we all know or all are building off of the same open standards, um, we can actually have containers that are going to maybe address those security concerns um, that can maybe run on other platforms they've not been able to run on before. Um, but we're actually going to have a large degree of similarities between them. Um, so you can actually, you know, still maybe potentially use what was a Docker container, but because they're built on the same standards, um, I don't have to actually run it as a Docker container. I could run it as a different type of container. So this is an important space to watch and just be aware of because you're going to see a lot of changes coming from that. Um, I know with RHEL 8, they actually, you can't install Docker, or I think you can if you really try hard enough, but they use something called Podman. And Podman is going to be built off of a specification like OCI, or it is built off of OCI, and um, actually allows you to run a container without a uh, daemon process that is got root privileges, because Docker, that's how Docker runs. Um, but I can still use commands just like I would with um, Docker build or Docker run. I just say podman build or podman run, um, and it will do the same thing. I can create a container and start it up and everything like that. So conceptually, it's all the same. I can do the same things. It's just a different container technology. All right. As we all know, when you introduce uh, lots of different containers or improvements, they can kind of start to run amok. So we've taken having these applications on various systems and their dependencies. Um, but now we can have all these containers. And if you look at and you imagine that sh ship with all these containers stacked, what if you need them to you know, move together or start up together or scale together? This is where Kubernetes starts to come in. This is why Kubernetes started to come in. We need some orchestration. Um, so, 
let's say we have this kind of little scenario where we have um, applications, you know, three and four, and we've got them um, replicated. So we've got some availability. So we've got 3A and 4A. Then maybe we've got a law collector and we've got some type of processor. So let's say that um, my law collector is one and the processing part is two. So I've got one also replicated in my production environment and I've got one A. So this is four containers and three containers. So not too bad. I can use Docker Compose. That's kind of the um, scenario we talked about earlier. It's not so bad, but could I make it easier? Well, with Kubernetes, you have the idea of um, pods. You have the idea of a manager and a worker node. So our manager is gonna be kind of like an, in our work environment who's kind of taking note of what's happening and the workers are just you know doing what they need to do. Um, but basically the manager can look and talk to um, the main process to say, okay, yeah, we need to scale, we need more resources. Um, whereas the workers are gonna be who's actually you know, the one being scaled. So yeah, let's add more worker nodes so we can get the work done. Um, it's very, very much like a real person scenario, but we can actually group things together in pods so they stay together. So let's take a look. So I know that my application three and application four I always want to be on the same host. So I can put them in a pod together. By putting them in a pod together, my managers will know that they're always going to be deployed together. They're going to have the same internal subnet and they're going to be on the same host. And Kubernetes, when it goes to scale that, will always make sure that, okay, I need more applications three and four. I'm going to have to deploy, you know, another pod with three and four, like three A and four A on the, in a different worker node, probably on a different uh, platform. But they're always going to be grouped together. They are easily to communicate. It's like they're in the same system. They are going to always be in the same system. Um, but they're different than, you know, maybe, um, you know, cube one, which was, uh, my law collector or maybe cube two, which was my, um, processing. So they're each in their own independent pods, um, because while they work with my applications, um, they're not dependent on them and they could be, they don't need to be in the same subnet and they could be, um, deploy differently and scale differently. So I need my applications to, you know, maybe have the utmost resources to keep working. Um, but the law collecting, you know, could happen a bit delayed. It's going to need to scale, but it's not so highly dependent on my applications. So it's in its own little pod. So the whole idea with Kubernetes is it's just a way to manage the networking and access. It's going to look at the state of your containers. It's going to scale and do load balancing. Um, if you have an unresponsive host, it can also relocate the work. Um, it can put storage with the containers and do service discovery, but really this is going to be what's kind of managing your environment and, and keeping it in check and balanced and performing how you want it to. So we went from manually installing all the libraries to having containers where we can have them set up in the containers and we can say, okay, use those. So now we can actually orchestrate those containers and say, yep, come up over here. Um, if you need more resources, you can go across, you know, these set of servers. I want to keep these containers together, um, things like that. So we can really make our environment run how we would expect it to. All right. So for the fun part, how can we use containers on IBM Z? We've been talking a whole lot of Linux this morning um, because that's where it all originated. And fortunately, we can run Linux on our IBM Z hardware as the IBM Linux One uh, platform, um, but we will also talk about the ZOS side um, and how containers apply in those scenarios and how you can use them. So let's take a look first at the Linux One side. So containers originated on Linux. So pretty much anything that you can do with containers on other architectures like Power, x86, um, ARM, whatever, it can be done on the S390X architecture as well. So you just look to make sure it's either got a no arch or an S390X architecture available and you can do what you'd like. They originate on Linux, we run Linux easy enough, right? You can also build on top of that. So um, leveraging our Linux One platform is the IBM Cloud HyperProtect services. Um, 
so within these are basically what we call secure enclaves or really they're they're basically really secure containers um, that are running on top of our Linux one uh, platform. So you have this high degree of isolation. Um, and this session today, I'm not going to go into all the security behind it. But if you join me next Tuesday, I'll talk about all of that. Um, but you could run, you know, something like your crypto service, you can actually have a uh, encrypted and dedicated cloud HSM um, that you keep your own keys for. So it's actually really cool. It's really highly utilized, but we'll talk uh, next week or I'll talk next week about the technology that underpins each of these offerings. Um, you know, databases are one of those things that are definitely being kind of containerized and used with Kubernetes to deploy and scale. Um, but do, do you want a greater level of security to know that where it's running, it's not gonna be able to access um, the host underneath it. So maybe you wanna have complete data confidential, confidentiality. Um, maybe you wanna know that your people running your system can't get to it, things like that. So you have the database as a service available in our HyperProtect uh, container. Um, virtual servers, this is where I've been spending a lot of my time lately. So you can actually start up a, a Linux uh, virtual machine, a virtual server. Um, and run it inside this really protected container. And then we'll actually have what we're calling hyper-protect containers um, that will work with Kubernetes um, where you will be able to build and deploy microservices in this um, very protected, secure container. All right, so a quick look at how this works. And this is what I'll dive into in my session next week if you come back on Tuesday. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about the Docker containers and I talked earlier about how um, when you start up Docker, and you might have caught it, you, so you can watch the video and kind of slow it down um, on the recording. Um, when you start up Docker, it starts up a, a daemon process, and that daemon process runs as root. And depending on how you start up your Docker containers, they could also be running as root. Um, those containers can be vulnerable to breakout exploits, and they can give access to the host layer. So when you run in the cloud and you're running a container in the cloud, you have no idea what host that you're on or who else is on it with you. So this can actually become a bit of a risk that you need to mitigate because what happens if somebody else is running on the same host layer, their container is exploited and they get access to the host layer and all of a sudden your container is compromised even though you've been doing everything you should. Um, also potentially you could have a sysadmin that has access to lower layers. Um, they might be able to see what's going on with your container and in your container. Um, and depending on what workload you have running in the cloud, this could be a, a big regulatory risk for you. So this is where the IBM Cloud HyperProtect containers really come in. Um, so with this, we run it in a secure enclave or secure service container, and we actually have that VM isolation. So um, you can't have the peer containers um, being, you know, people breaking out of them to be able to exploit the host layer. There is no shell access. So your somebody running that cloud environment is not gonna be able to um, you know, have a look at what's going on inside your container or you know, look at the memory or even access it from a hardware console. Um, there's no access uh, into the Kubernetes workers, which is really important because they're gonna be controlling everything. So we have those workers, um, but we're just not allowing the access into those to be able to see what's happening. You have encrypted storage. You're going to have encrypted cre uh, keys stored also as well. So it's just a greater level of security. So you know when you put your containers in the cloud that um, you're mitigating as much of the back end risks as you possibly can. Um, so these are some of the kind of risks that you would be mitigating. So you could be um, looking to prevent an inside data center physical attack. So Maybe the person you know running the cloud, we hear these scenarios, and unfortunately, they're real, or we wouldn't hear them. Um, where you know somebody gets you know persuaded to sell information. Um, I was telling the story. I won't say what geo I was in, and it turns out that this had actually happened. Um, where very recently, where somebody had given access and given the information on people on celebrities' um, credit card information and sold it, and the press had it. And I think all the tabloids were publishing it and sharing it. Um, so having something like this, where you don't have access to, to the memory or really to the dumps um, of what's going on within the system, um, where they can't just you know shell in 
which is the next one, basically having no way to give that information from a system support level really protects your staff or the staff running the cloud, um, as well as the people actually running on it. Um, just because it, you, you know immediately, like, I'm not violating any regulations. They're not going to take any sensitive information. They, they literally can't. Um, there's no console or shell or anything like that that they can access things. Um, and then the third, third one, the privilege escalation. So we aren't using um, Run C, we're using Run Q. And that actually allows us to isolate each worker in the secure enclave. So we don't have to worry about having the uh, breakouts from the container and exploiting the host there because um, we've been able to isolate them within the enclave. So it just starts to mitigate some of the risk that you could have with running containers in the cloud. All right. So if you are going to run in this really secure environment, you have to have a way to actually make sure you're building the right image. So this is where secure build server comes along. So this is where you can bring your own image, you'll sign it, it'll get registered, and then it can be approved and deployed. So you would want to do this because you want to make sure that what's getting deployed that's saved to production hasn't been altered along the way that you don't accidentally pick up some last minute changes that you weren't expecting. Um, you want to know that it's been um, signed off by everybody, all the right checks are in place, it's been verified. Um, basically, you just want to make sure that this is exactly what you want to do. So you are going to come back risk with signing the application, you're going to encrypt and register the application. So in the node bread scenario where I was deploying the container, it, it literally just went out to, to Docker and said, run this image. I didn't change anything in it. So it was able to just run that Docker image that already existed. But how do I know what version of that image? And how do I know what's in it? So this whole secure build process actually addresses that because you're gonna call a specific um, key that's gonna be signed and verified. So you know that you're getting exactly the image that you want and not you know, potentially picking up a newer one that you weren't anticipating that maybe is not gonna work with your application as well, or maybe has some other issues. Um, so let's take a look at how that process works. So developer, they publish their code to GitHub. N normal, easy enough, right? However you manage your code. So from that, we can generate and sign a secure build. So we're going to talk to the HyperProtect virtual server and say, okay, here's my builds. So then you can actually store that signed image. So we're going to create kind of our um, Docker image and store that in what's called Docker Content Trust. You can also, I think, use the IBM Cloud to do a, a trust, a, a secure build as well. Um, so if you store it in Docker Content Trust, you can set that up. There's keys. I've done it. It's not too bad. Um, and then you can actually automate the deploy with a trust chain. So we know we stored it, it's signed, it's in Docker Content Trust. I can say exactly which you know key for which image I want. So I know I'm getting the specific one, it's not been changed. Um, and I'm getting exactly what, I, what I'm after. In the future, we also will be able to inject audit capabilities. So we can have an auditor also sign it to verify, yep, this is exactly what it should have been or it's exactly what it should be. And they can endorse by with a signature. And then they'll also have a public key stored with it. So we've stored it when we initially signed it, but they'll also sign it as well. Um, so we know that it's been through all the approvals and it's gonna then get an endorsement from the virtual server. And we'll have a summary endorsement of all the endorsements done and we can deploy. So it's just another way to have more guarantee that you're getting exactly what you're after. So if you want to learn more about HyperProtect, um, there's a session on the, I think it's a crypto service this week. And then um, I'll talk next week about the underpinning technology. Um, if you've been playing with containers at all, and if you read very many articles, particularly about IBM, um, you know that Red Hat has OpenShift. So OpenShift is um, basically built on top of Kubernetes or really leverages Kubernetes, but it is a way to have a um, 
basically a, a way to manage your containers across multiple environments. Um, so it's going to be autonomous and secure. It's the full stack. Um, it does run on um, the IBM Linux One platform or runs, you can deploy to the IBM Linux One platform. Um, so you can deploy across the cloud. You can deploy across your internal systems. Um, but it's a full stack environment with um, Kubernetes and CoreOS. You can auto scale your cluster nodes. But basically, this is the kind of um, industry leading technology. Um, it basically builds more on top of what Kubernetes can do um, to give you more control and ability to work across different environments. Um, one of the things that we've been done doing to work more with the OpenShift environment are cloud packs. So cloud packs are going to be just pre-integrated services from um, the hybrid cloud for your cloud journey. So they're all going to be available on Z. Some of them are already available on Z. So I didn't update the slide like I probably should have. So you can have, um, we already have the application cloud pack for Z. I think now the data cloud pack is out, at least maybe in a limited form. Um, but you also see the multi-cloud integration automation security. So these are just packages of things together that work across the multi-cloud platform um, for your, all of your kind of hybrid cloud needs. So if you've not looked at those, just be aware that they're going to be able to run with containers um, and we'll have a lot of the technology that you need to make all of that happen. And it's a nice little bundle. All right, so let's take a look at what we can do with containers on the traditional ZOS side. So let's come back um, to where at least I began. All right, um, so I it's next Tuesday, but if you've not had any um, look into experience, um, research into the ZOS container extensions, I highly recommend that you do this. Um, so there's a session being done next Tuesday, I think it's around like 1 or 1.30 um, that you can watch. That I plan to watch it, I'm really curious <laughs> what all they're gonna show. But ZOS container extensions became available with ZOS 2.4. And what it allows you to do is it basically allows you to run Linux within a ZOS address space. Um, so it's separately provisioned, it's a Linux server, but it just runs as a ZOS address space. So you don't need to necessarily have a whole, you know, Linux LPAR where you're running ZVM or KVM or things like that. You can actually just have it in an address space. So you need um, the IBM service management un Unite suite. So, and it's got the PID for it that's available as a Docker image um, to use with ZCX. And then you can actually have a 90 day trial of it before you commit to using it. Um, and then it talks about the benchmark, which I'll skip over, but um, it's just a really cool technology that you can use as a way to work with your containers within ZOS. So you don't need additional skills. You don't need additional operating systems or anything like that. Um, so it really just helps us expand the whole software ecosystem. So let's kind of take a look at the traditional ZOS picture. So we'd have our ZOS address spaces. They could be DB2, Kix, IMS, Batch, um, MQ, you know, all sorts of things um, that we have running. And then we have this Unix system service site. Some people still shy away from it. I do love it, where you can run things. Java runs on both. Um, Web server ran on both. Um, ZOSMF runs on the Unix system services side. Something like Zoe will be on the Unix system services side. Um, if you ever use <laughs> Unix system services, you probably want Bash. Um, that'll run on at that side where you can have different commands and autocomplete and things like that. So we went from just kind of traditional ZOS for a lot of years to a while back having the Unix system services and kind of introducing us into a bit more of the Unixy, Linuxy type things. So now actually having the ZOS container extensions. So we're actually now just inside the ZOS address space and you can actually just run your containers in there. So it's Linux on Z software that's packaged as a Docker container running um, in ZOS. So you have the in-memory in data structure store. Um, there's a build automation tool. Um, you can put things like an application server or an OSQL database inside this container running in the ZOS address space. So it just opens the doors to a lot of possibilities and potentially better performance because you'll have um, co-located uh, workloads 
and potentially better uh, cross memory performance with their communication. Um, so benefits of it, workload modernization, um, you can use, you can enable existing or even maybe new ZOS applications to use services that were not available on ZOS. Um, maybe something you were trying to do or your team was trying to do. There's a large ecosystem of open source um, programs and applications that can run on the s architecture that you can now run on ZOS with no porting required. Um, there's an open mainframe project called Ambitus. It's actually a really cool project. Um, if you've not taken the time to go check out open mainframe project, it's just open source projects through the Linux Foundation for IBM Z. Um, you definitely should. So this is a collaboration on innovation workload deployment across the enterprise. That's one I'm highly interested in and I'm a member of and trying to see what I can do to help that come along. Um, you can also look at uh, the qualities of service. So co-location, it's gonna offer a lot of advantages. Hopefully we're all familiar with them, but you can have the advantages of scalability, scalability and availability. Um, you can have integrated disaster recovery with GDPS, but all these different things that you wouldn't have had. Things like workload manager, how you're gonna be responsive with workload manager and being able to take care of that. Um, you know, when it was on a separate LPAR, if it's on a completely different system, those things weren't necessarily possible. Then I'll become possible with being able to run that Linux uh, environment inside the ZOS address space. You've got operational efficiency. You can get more out of what you already have and the skills you already have. I'm not going to keep going through those, but I did want to play this little video and I'll talk through it. So um, this is actually ZCX in action and I'll apologize because it's probably not as big as you'd like, but we can log into um, TSO. We can go into um, SDSF and look at our output. We can see um, the ZCX address space running. Um, if you want the video, I can give you a hyperlink to it. It is not in the PDF, but let me know if you want to see it. But once I see it's running, I can actually then just SSH into the image and then I can run the command Docker images because Docker's already set up and I can see what images are running inside of it. So I could see there's a, a CLI for it already running. Um, I can add other images like Node Red, like MQTT. Um, and actually see what's happening. And I can see the log output there and I can take a look at the log output and see some of the same error messages on the same ZOS side. Um, but in this case, I've also run Node Red. So I start up a Node Red container and now I'm able to actually access it through um, my laptop. So all of these things that you can just do, but they're on the ZOS side. You don't need a separate environment or a separate server or different skills. You can just manage it through ZOS. So you just start up that and it'll go. All right, so for your reference, just because I want to save some time for questions, some primary use cases that you'll have, um, some questions to ask yourself to see if it will be a good fit for you. Um, you do have to build, if, you do, if an image is not already available through Docker or something like that, you may have to build your image, which is completely possible. You would just need a S390X environment to do that. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, you may be able to emulate that however you could do it, but that is just something to keep in mind. So you want to look to see if that, um, what you're after is already available or if you'd have to build it. And then could your software communicate with ZOS and external components using TCP IP? So questions to ask yourself to see if it's a good fit. Um, I debated about talking about Cloud Broker, but because Cloud Broker um, is a, a, lets us basically communicate with some of the container technologies, I felt like it couldn't go, I couldn't leave it out. It was just too important. All right, so Cloud Broker, I think it also became available with ZOS 2.4. And this is actually basically a, I call it like a translator, but it's a way that you can work with um, other container management to manage ZOS resources. So it does communicate through ZOSMF, but it is basically the translator so it now works with the OpenShift container platform. So you could say, um, you know, I've got my containers that I'm managing over here, but they are dependent on ZOS resources. So I could actually orchestrate and enable through Cloud Broker for um, OpenShift container platform to uh, control or maybe scale up some ZOS resources. So maybe I need another Kix region, um, maybe, maybe I need to start a Java process or something like that. Um, those are things that we can enable because Cloud Broker allows you to do that. So 
just again, for your reference, I want to save some time for questions. Um, some of these US Cloud Broker use cases um, that you can use, the reasons why you'd want to look at using it. And really, I wanted to get to here. So we're going to take a look to the future. So if you didn't see it, IBM has announced that they intend to deliver containers and Kubernetes orchestration for ZOS. And if you take just a second, you've got to realize how huge this is. We can actually have containers, not just running at ZCX, but we'll eventually have them on ZOS. How is this going to work? I have more questions than answers. Um, so we just have the statement of direction that we intend to deliver these. Um, it'll be a container runtime. It is going to be in support of the Open Containers Initiative that I mentioned that started a few years ago through the Linux Foundation. It was one of the main reasons I wanted to make sure that was mentioned. Um, but basically, we'll have a, a form of containers that will run on ZOS. And we intend to also have the Kubernetes orchestration which that opens the door to working with things like OpenShift and things like that down the road, um, because those are all going to be built on top of the Kubernetes, um, you know, methodology of how everything works. So this is going to be a huge changing space for us. So stay tuned. Hopefully, you know, in a few months and in a year and a couple of years, whatever it is, um, I'll be able to talk more about this, but this becomes a game changer because now Zales can fully participate in this, ability to create microservices and to be able to run and to be able to be dynamic, but still give all of the qualities of service that we would know and love on our ZOS side. Um, just a reminder, so we've got about eight minutes left. Um, you can submit your session feedback. Please do let me know um, other things you'd like to hear about. Um, if there's something I'm covering that you'd like to know more about, let me know. I'd love to cover that in a future session. Um, the session is 2 a.m., which for a long time I thought was some time somewhere in the world. <laughs> then I realized it was my session number. Um, anyways, the QR code is on there as well if you'd like to scan with the QR code from your phone. Um, but yeah, please fill out your session feedback. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and we'll take a look at the chat to see if there's any questions. Manny, thanks, Jen. I think that was clearly um, very clear to everybody. There's been no questions so far. I've just asked if there's anybody who has anything they would like to ask. So uh, just final check for anybody on the call if you have any questions for Jen about today's session. Okay. Doesn't look like there's anything coming through. So I'd just like to thank you, Jen. That was uh, fantastic. I think there was some um, we, I don't think we lost anybody out of the call over the hour. So uh, that's one of the records, I think, so far. So uh, many thanks again. Thanks, Paul. In which case, we are done. Um, Jen's already reminded you about filling in the, the feedback form. So uh, many thanks for your time. Um, and uh, I'll close today's session. Thanks again, Jen. <laughs>